Jonathan Solomon Sr. is my husband. We got married in 1956. Ever since me and him, we worked together in uh, Jonathan. Go to the meeting lots. You went all over the world, go to the meeting and help people and telling the people how how we can survive. Can I have And I'm Jonathan's niece. Actually, he's my great uncle, but he always said, this is my niece. And it always gave me pleasure when he said that because um, he's a great uncle. And I really mean he's a great uncle because he's always teaching, especially this big issue with Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. I've uh, been taught by him to take care of our land and uh, animals always and to love one another. And it's uh, the nation, the Quichin nation, is going to sorely miss him because he, he had a passion for taking care of his home and his people and his culture. Jonathan was a one-of-a-kind sort of leader. He had a background in the military after growing up in a, out in the woods, learning from his father, trapping and hunting. Then he was put into the political arena to protect the Gwich'in communities from being flooded with the proposed rampart dam project. And then he talked about how when that was over, he would be able, he thought, okay, you know, can just sit back and have a regular life. And then the next thing he knew, he heard that uh, there was proposed drilling in the Arctic Refuge. So he was called to action. Every day, every day meeting an Arctic. He didn't aspire to do this. It was thrust on him. He just, he felt obligated to. And he said this many times in public that really I wasn't really, this is not what I wanted to do my whole life. But he felt compelled to to be that voice, you know, to, and he always made it clear that he spoke from his heart, not his head. AFN one time he stood up. Of course, all of the other native leaders are dressed in their black and whites or beautiful ties, they look beautiful. They have a wonderfully scripted, uh, you know, their, their speech. And he'll go up in a white t-shirt, you know, his sleeves rolled up, and he's got something important to say. And he, he says, well, you know, I'm not going to come up here and read out to you what my, what my secretary typed out for me the morning before. I'm going to tell you what's bothering me and I'm going to share from my heart, you know. And so that's how he connects with people. And this is why people want him to represent them because he's, he's not battling wits intellectually. He's saying, this is, this is where it's affecting us, you know, this is us, our culture, our whatever the issue is, you know, if it's, and he, he's able to transfer it into a heart, heart-to-heart communications and people respond to that. My name is Peter Solomon. I'm from Gutierrez, yeah. Jonathan's youngest brother. But one of the things that I remember in the earliest time is uh, the amount of energy that he had. This man gave his life to working on land issues and things, and still he would go home and live his Indian way of life. He would come back from Washington, D.C. and sleep about two hours and hit the river and do the fishing and hunting and whatever had to be done. Jonathan was always pushing me from the back. And now I just have to look forward and realize that he's here and continue whatever he wants and needs to be done. You know, Jonathan wasn't, you know, real tall, but he's got a big presence. He just has, he, he was, uh, 
whenever you're around him, you just feel like it's this big guy, you know, and he just exuded this authority. You knew in, in your heart, before your head knew it, you knew you were talking to a chief. Two years ago, he was just really sick, but he can't get around, but he still went up to Old Crow and got us five caribou. He bring back, he bring back five caribou. That's the last time he hunt for us. The thing I'll miss most about him is, I think, just him and uh, the love he had for uh, his people. He loved a good fight and uh, he loved life. He really loved his family. Gwich'in Nation, he'll be missed. Just recently I spoke to him and he said, they're not gonna do it in my lifetime, drill for oil, and he's right, it didn't happen. But we can't stop there. We also have to think in the same way and continue on whatever needs to be done. We all know that just, you know, we're gonna miss our dad so much and very much. But the most important is of all this knowledge and all this wisdom that he passed on to us, we can never ever have much as he had and were that we really need him for that. But I know that God will send somebody to replace us. But it's, gonna, it's not going to be like my dad. But there'll be somebody there to pick it up and learn and continue fighting for no drilling. Thank you so much. Masi Chosh like now. Thank you so much. Masi Chosh. Was. It has been a long fight since then. 1975, 30 years ago. We've been that road a lot of time. We need your help. You, the young adults, the elders, the youth. Tell them I want to walk that same hallways as my leaders walk, telling about our lifetime, telling about our life, telling that Congress and telling the senators that we don't want no development. We need you.